Now friend, this is an invitation for anyone that is thirsty to experience the power of God. It is a deeper dimension of the same Holy Spirit that makes the new birth a reality in you. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Baylis Conley. Hello, friend. We have been on this wonderful series about the invitations of Jesus. Invitations that he gave to people on the Sea of Galilee, invitations that he gave to crowds that didn't just apply to them, but they're just as applicable to us in our lives in practical ways. And the Lord wants us to respond to these invitations as well. So we're going to begin by looking at one of Christ's invitations where he says, come to me and drink. What does that mean? How, how can we apply that in our lives? You know, the Bible is not just beautiful prose that we're supposed to get done in a, a beautifully scripted hand and put on our, our mirror or on the wall. It's not just to be admired, it's to be applied. It's not just to be applauded. God wants us to put his word into practice. So come to me and drink. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. You ready? I'm ready as well. We uh, began a series last Saturday night. I thought I was going to be able to finish it tonight, but I'm not. But uh, I'll give you as much as time will allow. And let's pray and just set our hearts to receive. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace that rests over us right now, that is working in our behalf, even as we're putting the kingdom first. We realize, we believe, even as the Lord told us, that all of the things that we tend to be concerned about and worried about, you'll cause all of those things to be added on to us as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. So speak to us tonight by your spirit. And Jesus, may you be glorified. If you agree, say amen. amen. All right. We began speaking about this last week, and we found that throughout the Gospels, Jesus offers a number of invitations to people, but they, they don't just apply to those that were physically present at the time. They're applic applicable to us as well. By the grace of God, we're going to look at three more tonight. So the third one is this. Jesus said, come to me and drink. John chapter 7. Look there with me if you would. John's gospel, the seventh chapter. We'll begin in verse 37. It says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now on the final day of the feast, and actually what took place is on that final, they called it the great day of the feast, a priest would go to the pool of Siloam with a vessel. He would fill it with water, come back into the temple, and then he would pour that water over the sacrifice while the people stood around and they sang a verse from Isaiah 12 and 3. Therefore, with joy will you draw water from the well of salvation. And no doubt it was at that very moment that Jesus cried out that as the scripture is said, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water if you come to me and if you drink. Because that little ceremony that they were doing was a type and a shadow that pointed to him. Obviously, referring to the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. You know, these living waters throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, the work of the Spirit many times 
is, is typed as water, as, as rain, as, as a river, you know, as a sea. And once Jesus was raised from the dead, people that believed on him could be born of the Spirit. That living water or eternal life would be granted to them. But I believe there's more here. Jesus said out of his heart would flow rivers or out of his spirit. You know, Peter wrote this in 1 Peter, the third chapter. He talked about the hidden man of the heart, which is the spirit. So when Jesus talked about the heart, he's talking about the spirit, the hidden person, the real you. I'm a spirit being. You really can't see me. You can see the body I live in. It has freckles all over it. Didn't ask for those. But there you go. The house I live in has green windows. The house I live in is losing some hair. <laughs> and actually, it's growing out other places that it didn't <laughs> used to grow. But the real Bayless is hidden. I'm a spirit being created in the image of God. And it's that spirit being on the inside that has received the life of God that's been born again. But Jesus said, out of your heart will flow rivers. And I believe that Jesus is referring to more than a person's initial salvation experience. I believe he's speaking to an experience subsequent to salvation that the Bible calls being baptized in the Holy Spirit or receiving the Holy Spirit. He said this, he spoke of the Spirit, but the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. In fact, look back just a couple chapters in John chapter 4. Jesus uses this same analogy or a similar one, typing the work of the Holy Spirit to water. And he's speaking to the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. And look what he says to her in verse 13 of John chapter 4. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And so no doubt he, you know, uh, uh, made some gesture toward the well. He said, you drink that water, you're going to be thirsty again, but I've got water that if you drink of it, you won't be thirsty anymore. The water that I give will be in a person springing up, a, a spring of, of living water, some translations say a well of water, a type of the Holy Spirit's work in salvation, springing up into everlasting life. Now, a spring, it sustains life. A well, you can put the bucket down in the well, put the bucket in the spring, you can take the bucket out and it sustains life. But a river produces power. I have a friend that has a ranch, and right next to his ranch house, he has this amazing arte artesian spring. It is the, 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 the purest, the tastiest water you've ever put to your lips. And you know what? It's been there for who knows how many thousands of years, just bubbling up, this, this sort of living well. But on the perimeter of his property, there's a river that runs by. Now, you can drink from both, but there's a difference. The river can produce power. The river can turn wheels. The river can move things. The well sustains life. The river does more than that. Look with me in Acts chapter 1, if you would. It's just the next book over. We're in John, Acts chapter 1. This is after the resurrection now. Jesus said, or the scripture said, that when he said, come to me, anyone that's thirsty, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This he spoke of the Spirit, who those believing on him afterwards would receive. Acts chapter 1, after the resurrection, look what Jesus says. Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 8, but you shall receive power. Everyone say power. power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. 
Acts 2 and 4 is where they were filled, 120 in the upper room. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We move a little bit into the future. Acts chapter 8, Philip has gone down to the city of Samaria. He's preaching Christ to them. There's miracles. And the Bible said the people believed the preaching of Philip concerning the kingdom of God and concerning the name of Jesus, and they were baptized. And then Jerusalem, the church at Jerusalem, gets wind that there's a revival happening in Samaria. And so we read Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now apparently, Peter and John and the apostles in Jerusalem didn't think that these believers had received all the Holy Spirit that there was to get. They went down to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, they certainly were saved. They said they'd received the Word of God. The Scripture says we're born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God that lives and abides forever. Jesus said in Mark 16, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. They believed the preaching of Philip and they were baptized according to Jesus himself. They were saved, but the apostles realized there was an experience subsequent to salvation that they needed, so they came down and prayed for them. And friend, that's where the river begins to flow out of a person's spirit. That's where power comes from. You can read in Acts chapter 10, 10 years after the day of Pentecost, a group in the house of Cornelius, they're saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. In Acts chapter 19, nearly 20 years after the day of Pentecost, Paul comes to a group of men and he asks a question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now that would be a foolish question if you got all the Holy Spirit there was to get when you got saved. Why would you ask that? And they said, well, we, we haven't even heard about that. And Paul laid hands on them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues and prophesy. A friend, this is an invitation for anyone that is thirsty to experience the power of God. It is a deeper dimension of the same Holy Spirit that makes the new birth a reality in you. You don't need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. You need to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be washed in the blood of the Lamb to go to heaven. But there is an experience that is available with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus offers an invitation. Are you thirsty? Do you want more? Do you want power? You've got a well, you've got a spring, but do you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? He says, well, then come to me and drink. You know, I got filled with the Spirit in the same mission where I got saved. It's a little street mission. I accepted Jesus, cried, they laid hands on me, I got set free from years of, of substance abuse, never have, have taken illegal drugs again. And then I went back some nights later and there was a group of us all holding hands in the front, praying, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues and I've done that regularly for the last 40 years. Speaking to God, as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 14, he that speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak to men, but he speaks to God. He also said, just a couple of verses later there, he that prays or speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself. Now that's actually an old English translation, even though our Bibles have it. It meant to build an edifice higher and higher, one stone upon another. The most modern translation, if you wanted to, to put it in modern language, he that prays in an unknown tongue speaks to God and charges himself like a battery. You know, my, my wife, I love my wife so much. She's sitting on the front row. I have to be careful. <laughs> but it's true. We've been married 35 years. And, you know, I, I've just noticed something about her that, you know, we both have the identical mobile phones. 
But the battery on her phone, I'll ask her, she says, oh, I've got 11%. I ask her, oh, it's 8%. You know, I mean, when it's 28%, hallelujah, let's release the balloons. But her phone, the battery almost always seems to be flat. You know, me, it gets down to 79%. I say, I got to plug this thing in. We're just different that way. But I will tell you this, even though the battery on her phone many times is flat, her spirit is never flat. Every single day that I've been married to this woman for 35 years, she spends time talking to the Father in other tongues. Every, I mean, every day. She sits in our bedroom, sits in a chair, speaks in other tongues, talks to God, and charges her spirit with power. It's important. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to Cottonwood Church, because that's the only place you can get it. No, if anyone thirsts, let him go to the nearest Pentecostal church because that's the only place his blessing's being handed out. No, Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty for this, let him come to me and drink. The only place you can get it is from Jesus. You know, in John chapter 1, John said this about Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world and he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. You read it there. He said, Jesus does two things. Takes away the sin of the world. I know when that happened to me, friend. I also know when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's an invitation. I received it in a street mission. My wife received the Holy Spirit, was filled with the Spirit in a charismatic Catholic prayer meeting. My mother got filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other tongues, watching TBN. with Jerry Bernard on there, inviting people to receive the baptism in the Spirit. I remember walking in the room, and there's my mother crying, speaking in other tongues. I got a friend. You know, I shared about the baptism of the Holy Spirit with him, prayed, and nothing happened. And uh, that night, he went out, and he said, I was just hungry. He said, and I was riding around my bike at night, talking to God about it, and all of a sudden, I began to speak in other tongues, got filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, my dad, my dad's interesting. Frightening, actually, because uh, I'm becoming more and more like him. <laughs> the family says it to me all the time, oh, that's your dad, Bayless. I go, shut up, shut up. <laughs> There's actually a lot of ways I want to be like him, but um, there are some eccentricities that I would like to avoid. <laughs> but my dad, you know, he was the last one to come into the, the fold, last one to, to give his life to Jesus. Um, when I came back from Oregon after being gone for four years and, uh, you know, shoved the gospel down everyone's throat, I remember one day he said, Bayless, I liked you better when you were on drugs. <laughs> and so he was a little slow to come into the kingdom. And uh, the whole family had been saved, and then eventually everyone got filled with the Spirit, had that experience. And one night, my office was actually, it was in a room in our little house at the time. I had a desk I'd spent $5 on in a yard sale in there. And I was on my face. I was praying, seeking God. And I had a visitation. This is a lot of years ago. This is probably 32 years ago. So don't get the idea that this happens all the time. It's only happened once to me in my life. Only once. It was then. I was on my face, I was praying, and suddenly the presence of Jesus was in the room. And I knew he was there, and it scared me. He was standing there. I was afraid to look up, but I knew it was him. And I felt in my spirit, he said words to me. He said, what would you like me to do? And you'd think you'd have this big list of things, and my, I, man, I drew a blank absolutely overwhelming that presence that came into that room. And the one thing that came into my heart, I said, Lord, I'd like my dad to receive the fullness of the Spirit. Felt like Jesus just nodded his head and suddenly that presence was gone. And in about 30 seconds, with fear and trembling, I, I looked up and looked around the room and he was gone. But I know that Jesus visited me. One week later, I'm at my dad's house. I'm helping him unload his van. We're loading stuff out of the back of the van, and he hits me with his elbow 
in my ribs really hard. He says, guess what? I said, what? He said, I speak in tongues. <laughs> Who did that? Jesus did that. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart, out of his spirit will flow rivers of living water. Now, certainly that is not all there is to being baptized in the spirit. There's many other evidences that the scriptures talk about. But let us not sell short something that the scriptures talk so much about. And you actually have to purposely avoid it to not see it in the scriptures. This physical evidence of speaking in other tongues. I wish I had more time just to go on about that, but I want to move on. People that think they can explain God or the human condition, you know, by a few lines or a few paragraphs. They consider themselves wise and educated and intelligent. God has hidden these weighty truths from those, and He reveals them to those that come in childlike faith. You know, Jesus, according to his own words here, is the only one that can reveal the Father to someone. No one else can. So the invitation then to a weary, burdened world that is looking for rest, looking for inner peace, looking for satisfaction, looking for that, that, that crazy missing thing, the invitation of Jesus is come, and I'll introduce you. And as you take my yoke upon you, you'll find out that that yoke is not one of elitism, superiority, or pride, but it's a yoke of gentleness, humility, and meekness. And once I introduce you to the Father, you will find your rest. Jesus' yoke is one of humility and meekness. And for those of you that don't know a yoke, if you had two oxen, there was this piece of wood that fit over the necks of both of the oxen. And you'd usually take an untrained, you know, oxen and put it with one that was very trained to the task. And as it took the lead from that one, it would follow and it would learn to do its work. And that's the analogy Jesus is using here. Jesus demonstrated the ultimate dependence on God and obedience to God the Father in childlike trust. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. Bayless will continue with part two of his message next week. You know, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, nor am I ashamed of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I read the Bible, I just want to to embrace everything that God has for me. And I think sometimes we, we want to pick and choose. Well, I, I like that, and oh, that sounds kind of weird. I, I don't want anything to do with that. And oh, this is good, and oh, that there, that's too hard. No, no, we need to take it as a whole. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And though world cultures may have changed, world events may have changed. His church remains the same, and the Holy Spirit is here to empower us. And you know, we ended as I was talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. You know, I, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit as a, a very, very young believer, and every day of my life since then, I've taken time to pray in other tongues. The scripture says, he that speaks in an unknown tongue doesn't speak to men, but he speaks to God, and he edifies himself, or he builds himself up with energy or with strength. And I pray that you, you continue following us in the future messages. We, we deal more with some of these things uh, in the future. But you know, God has wonderful gifts for us. One of them after that, that gift of salvation is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Read about it, find out about it, experience it in Jesus' name. And now here's Bayless with an inspirational thought you can apply today. Hi there. I have been uh, for the last week in different countries in Europe uh, doing evangelistic meetings, preaching the gospel, ministering to people. We've seen a lot of people come to Christ. And in each of the meetings so far, I have prayed a healing prayer for people that have been in the services that have been sick. It's something that I felt very distinctly led by God to do. 
And a young lady came up to me after the service. She said, well, didn't the Apostle Paul himself say, you know, that he had a thorn in the flesh? And she wanted to, me to sit down, and it would have been a, <clears throat> a long discussion, but there was about, you know, 50 people in line waiting. And so I didn't have the opportunity to speak with her. But, you know, what she brought up seems to be a stumbling block to a lot of people when it comes to healing. You know, I, I've heard it so many times. Well. You know, God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh and Paul was sick and Paul asked God three times to be healed and, uh, uh, you know, God didn't heal him. So maybe this is just a thorn in the flesh for me. Well, let's just read it and just, just think about it. I don't have time and, you know, to go on this in detail, but just some things that you can study for yourself. Second Corinthians 12 and seven, Paul said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Paul says specifically what that thorn in the flesh was. He said it was a messenger of Satan, not something from God. It was a messenger of Satan. The word messenger is the same Greek word translated angel. And then he said, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So Paul pleaded with God three times that it might depart and the Lord's answer. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now. God didn't say, no, I'm not going to heal you, Paul. First of all, it wasn't a sickness. Again, it was a messenger of Satan. God said, my grace is all you need. My grace is sufficient for you. In fact, that phrase sufficient for you, look it up. If you think I'm making this up, it literally means to build a hedge of protection around. God said to him, my grace will be a hedge of protection round about you. When it seems like the oppression is there and the devil's attacking you, I want to tell you God's grace is sufficient for you. It will build a barrier, a protection round about you. And we're, you're at the end of your strength, my friend. That's when God's strength can take over. Go ahead and read it. Think about it. Do some studying on your own. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's Word in our daily lives. Hello, friend. I am very excited because I'm coming back to Europe. We're going to be holding some meetings and sharing the Word of God, which I always love doing. But you know, one of the highlights of these meetings is meeting people just like you, getting to talk to um, our partners and people that watch the broadcast. So I want to encourage you, find out about a meeting that is going to be near you and please come out. I'd love to meet you and I'm going to have a message in my heart to share with you. Coming to Europe soon. Sometimes it's easy to feel blocked by obstacles, detoured by challenges, and held captive by tough times. Regardless of what you may feel right now, Answers with Bayless Conley is here to bring you practical tools to help you understand and fulfill the calling God has placed on your life. That's why we would like to send you a copy of Bayless Conley's message, Finishing Your Course, as our expression of appreciation for your support to the ministry this month. You need to know what you're called to do. Notice his language, that I might finish my race and the ministry which I received from the Lord. Very personal, very unique to him. And I have a question for you. What have you received from the Lord? What have you specifically received from Him? Use the information on the screen to contact the ministry and request your copy of Finishing Your Course on CD or DVD. It's our gift to thank you for your support. Faithfully finish the course God has set for you. Again, use the information on the screen to connect with Answers with Bayless Conley. For your gift to support the ministry, we'll send you a CD or DVD copy of Bayless's life-changing message, Finishing Your Course. Your gift helps us continue to bring our living Savior to a dying world.